Hi, I'm Dr. Alex Tackard at the University of Chester. I've been teaching there since 2009. Um, here is my Twitter handle and my email address. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about Aubrey Beardsley and disability studies. I discussed this topic recently with my first year critical theory students, and I was also interviewed about it very briefly on a BBC4 documentary called Scandal and Beauty, Mark Gatiss on Aubrey Beardsley, and that's still available on iPlayer right now. Um, this is my book, Tuberculosis and Disabled Identity in 19th Century Literature, Invalid Lives. It's a very snappy title, but it is actually a really great cover. It's got germs on it, everything you could possibly want in a book cover. Please, if you have any questions, do type them at the side of the screen. I will answer them at the end. Um, I will keep pushing on with the talk until we get there. Now, Aubrey Beardsley, who was born in 1872, was a disabled writer, artist, illustrator, and pornographer. He's probably one of the most notorious and influential British designers of the 1890s, which was itself a fantastic era for graphic design of all kinds. He became famous in 1894 as um, illustrating the English edition of Oscar Wilde's play Salome. And he was also art editor of The Yellow Book. This is a yellow book. This is an 1894 yellow book. They were produced in large numbers, so it's not a, a, a valuable antique. I wouldn't have it in my house otherwise. Um, when Oscar Wilde was arrested for gross indecency in 1895, he had a book with a yellow cover in his pocket. It was not actually a yellow book, but Beardsley, because he'd worked with Wilde before and because his public persona was queer in indefinable ways, um, was disgraced along with Wilde, tainted by association, even though they were not very close, they were more perhaps frenemies, I think might be the word. Um, Beardsley lost his post on the yellow book. He lost the lease on his house. Um, it, was, it was disastrous for him professionally. Did he curl up and die and crawl away? No, he responded to this public attack by producing even more outrageous work. He died at the age of 25 in 1898 of tuberculosis. Well, I'll go into more detail about Aubrey Beardsley later. First of all, I want to explain the very basics of critical disability studies, at least as they're relevant to Aubrey Beardsley. So the first question we should ask is what is disability? And this is rather more complicated than many people might think um, because different cultures attribute different meanings to physical and mental variations in the population. So the same, what seems to be the same impairment might mean something very different in a different cultural context. In one context, it might be stigmatized and another, it might be celebrated. Um, for example, in many cultures, a particular illness or impairment might be seen as a curse or indeed a blessing from the gods. In an industrial society particularly, um, any body that can't fit and work within a factory system um, is becomes a worthless body that needs to be either fixed so it can work in the factory or eliminated from the population, even though that body might be perfectly functional in other contexts. And this particularly might apply to people with chronic illness who don't have the stamina necessarily to stand at the cotton mill, at the um, weaving machines for 12 hours at a time. So this is why the social model of disability locates disability not in the individual body, but in the socioeconomic structures and cultural stereotypes and stigma that disable people with different physical and cognitive functions. We all have bodies and bodies function in all kinds of different ways, but those bodies are always experienced in a cultural context. But Literature then plays a crucial role in reflecting those social structures and cultural attitudes and in shaping those cultural attitudes as well. It's um, quite a dynamic relationship between literature and the culture it inhabits. And sometimes literature can challenge those cultural stereotypes. So in this lecture, I'll be talking about a real person who was enormously influenced by cultural stereotypes, but in a very, very strange and um, entertaining way, I think. The cultural stereotype I need to talk about here is the Victorian consumptive stereotype. 
So here I have Clark Lawler's book, Consumption and Literature, The Making of the Romantic Disease. I, I really love this book. I think it's great. And Lawler explains that for centuries, English literature and culture associated chronic wasting diseases like tuberculosis with um, spirituality, piety, sensitivity, and sometimes particularly in the Romantic era with special creativity and poetic inspiration. The, the image we should think of here is the soul burning brighter as the body wastes away. And in 19th century literature, there are many, many, many consumptive characters. They're often quite minor, or if it's a main character, they'll die at the end. Um, and they die young and beautiful because they're just too fragile to exist in this cruel world. Excellent example of consumptive stereotype would be Helen Burns in Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, which was published in 1847. Um, and she dies piously, you know, oh, I'm not suffering, I'm glad to die young. Exactly the same year, Charlotte's sister, Emily Bronte, brings out Wuthering Heights, which uses the same stereotypes and rips them to shreds and makes them ridiculous and um, horrifying as well. So these stereotypes, though, were applied to real people, especially the poet John Keats. There he is, who died in 1821 at the age of 25. I was in love with him as a teenager. His letters I find much more interesting than his poetry, personally. Um, he's the archetypal um, consumptive genius, and acquaintances like Percy Bysshe Shelley insisted that Keats died because he received a bad review on some of his poetry and that made his lungs bleed and that's how he got consumption. Now, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'd, I'd be fairly certain you can't get tuberculosis from a bad poetry review. It's actually a bacterial infection. Aubrey Beardsley, born in 1872, is a couple of generations after Keats, but Keats's influence continues throughout the, the 19th century and into the 20th century, or rather not Keats himself, but the stereotypes attached to Keats. And Beardsley's a sickly child, and he seems to have been diagnosed with consumption at the age of seven. But it's when he's 17, he's working as an insurance clerk in London, he starts coughing up blood. And this is a sign that he has the adult form of tuberculosis. He must know that he probably won't live through his 30s. It was incurable at the time. Um, he would probably be increasingly physically impaired. Um, he would often be unable to work. And many people with tuberculosis died in the workhouse because there was no social system to support people with chronic illness. Um, I have here my favourite biography of Aubrey Beardsley, which I think I was given as a present for passing my GCSEs before many of you were born. Um, this is Matthew Sturgis's biography of Aubrey Beardsley. This is Aubrey Beardsley posing like a gargoyle. Um, he had a, I mean, I know I can't talk because we we're all having hair problems at the moment. He, he chose to have a very eccentric haircut. Um, but Sturgis says that when he becomes ill as a young adult, he starts to immerse himself in literature and art representing consumptives. Um, literature by consumptive writers, art by consumptive artists like Watteau. Um, he starts to draw these artists. He starts to draw consumptive characters from literature like La Dame au Camille. And Sturgis says that he's trying to position himself and understand his own situation in the context of those other consumptive cultural figures. Now, from a disability studies perspective, we'd say that he's forming a disabled identity and a sense of disability pride that this diagnosis is nothing to be ashamed of. This life, this difficult life he faces isn't something to be ashamed of. It's actually a source of great creativity and inspiration. And while he's off work sick, he writes a story and gets it published. Um, and he starts to work very, very seriously on his drawing. His first commission as an artist is illustrating Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, which is a medieval piece of literature. And the style was pre raphaelite His drawings were supposed to be pre raphaelite um, Very respectable commission. Beardsley can't stay respectable for long. He just, he just can't. He's compelled to be outrageous. In 1893, he produces this drawing here. 
inspired by Oscar Wilde's um, play Salome. And as you can see, you have a very androgynous Salome kissing a severed head, the severed head of John the Baptist, with um, I've kissed your mouth, Yokanan, I've kissed your mouth. It's very surreal. There are all these weird shapes. There's blood pouring out with plants growing out of the blood. He's influenced by Japanese art. So you're getting this Japanesque distortion of his pre-Raphaelite um, previous designs. Um, you, you could ask your grandparents. Um, he, he became very, very famous again in the 1960s as an influence on psychedelic art. And you can see everything's floating around and strange there. Uh, this is one of my favourite drawings of his, actually. Oscar Wilde loved it. Um, and Beardsley was commissioned to do the full illustrations for the English edition of Salome, which would be released in 1894. Some of the drawings that Beardsley produced for Salome are pictures of people masturbating. There are aborted fetuses everywhere, penises everywhere. Um, the editor told him to redraw some of these drawings because they were not suitable, they were not legal for publication. So Beardsley did with an ill grace. But the thing is with Beardsley, that a lot, a lot of the penises in his drawings are not just where you anatomically expect to find them. So they're popping out of the furniture, they're popping out of the landscape, out of plants. Um, here, the, the, the editor didn't catch all of the penises that Beardsley felt compelled, felt were absolutely necessary to this um, illustrative work. Beardsley also wrote a, a pornographic novel, which he left unfinished, uh, The Story of Venus and Tarnhauser. Um, I know these things are subjective, but I I can't think of anything less erotic. It's it's really stomach churning, this book. So please, maybe don't go and look for that particular book. Um, what's interesting here then is that Beardsley definitely relates to some aspects of the consumptive stereotype. He is creative. He is burning too bright to live long. His artistic development is so fantastically accelerated. He often runs several artistic styles at the same time in different commissions, never mind producing one after the other. He's producing multiple different styles at once, um, where many artists might take years to develop a particular style. And he actually tells a friend, I shall not live much longer than did Keats. So he's deliberately aligning himself with some stereotypes of consumptive genius. But is Beardsley sensitive and pious and helpless, this passive victim of a harsh world? Well, I mean, he was pious. He was an avid churchgoer. He, and then he converted to Roman Catholicism um, at the end of his life. But fragile and passive, perhaps not. So in 1894, he and another consumptive writer, Henry Harland, start The Yellow Book, which is, you can see it's kind of lurid and rather ugly. Um, it's one of the most notorious publications of the 1890s. If you watch the documentary on iPlayer that I'm in briefly, um, an art scholar is explaining that, that this image would be understood as to an 1890s audience. Um, it would be understood that this lady's a prostitute doing her her makeup by essentially street lights, really. Um, it's but this particular number is really special. I mean, it contains not only the art editor and literary editor are both consumptive. It also contains work by Ernest Dowson, who was also consumptive. It's a very consumptive version. But there's something really, really special in here as well. Um, the definitive image of the Victorian consumptive, I think, in art and literature is the sickbed or deathbed. So you'll see plenty of images of a limp invalid lying on their sickbed, gazing up to heaven, setting an example of pious suffering to others. Henry Peach Robinson's photograph fading away from 1857 or 58 is an excellent example of this. If you want to Google it later, it's really, really interesting. But this is Beardsley's version of the consumptive sickbed deathbed. There we go. So there he is. He is... Ooh, Page is falling out. Um, he's in bed. The little bit of writing in the corner says, not all the monsters are in Africa, implying that he's monstrous. It's this opulent, rather sinister bed with a, you know, almost pornographic little figure in the bedpost. And if you look very, very closely, you can see Beardsley. There he is. He's tiny, tiny, peeping out at you, possibly winking. He's not 
doesn't seem to be suffering piously or otherwise. Um, it's very mischievous and it's very beardly. We need to think about this as a consumptive self-portrait. We should never talk about Beardsley being successful despite his illness or overcoming his disability or he's not defined by his disability as if that would be a bad thing for him because his disability is a huge part of who he is as an artist. When he's interviewed in the press, he talks about himself as an invalid. He describes himself as an invalid who travels and goes on adventures and has a good time, even when he was often very, very ill and couldn't get out of bed for weeks. He doesn't want to be seen as um, pathetic and tragic because those are the stereotypes he's really having to challenge in his, you know, in his work as a consumptive artist. But we need to be aware as well that in the 1890s, those saintly consumptive stereotypes are starting to mutate. The rising eugenics movement characterizes all disabled people as basically disgusting degenerates who need to be eliminated from society, who are contaminating the species. And Beardsley's art is constantly condemned in the press as diseased and corrupt and a bad influence and obviously the work of someone unsound in body and mind. And one magazine editor actually calls Beardsley via his work sexless and unclean. Um, sexless in this context would mean um, perhaps not clearly male or female or gender queer in some way um, rather than it does, it's not full of sex because it is full of sex. And so he's sexless and unclean. How does this sensitive consumptive invalid respond to this terrible attack? Well, he writes back to the magazine editor. He writes, as to my cleanliness, as my, I do my best for it in my morning bath. And if he has any doubts as to my sex, he can come and see me take it. So if Beardsley's threatened, he threatens to get naked. Um, whenever he's called disgusting, he just gets more disgusting. Now, one thing to think about here, though, is that consumptive artists are supposed to die young and incomplete. And in 1896, it becomes clear, I think, to Beardsley that he probably is nearing the end of his life. So he designs this beautiful book of 50 drawings. Um, this is, again, this is an 1897 original book of 50, 50 drawings, except this one has 45 drawings because it's a badly damaged one. Again, that's that's why I own it. Um, so he produces this volume that gives the impression of a complete life's work, a complete life's achievement by the time he dies at the age of 25. So in conclusion, then. Beardsley is a hugely influential artist and designer who showed a clear sense of disabled identity and disability pride. He's also a clear example of the way real disabled people have had to negotiate and interact with cultural stereotypes. This is not about overcoming disability or being famous despite his disability. It's a huge part of who he is as an artist. And at a time when critics were condemning diseased, queer, perverted art, he elevated that art to greater heights of perversion. Thank you. That's the end of my talk. And I'll see if there are any questions I can answer at the side. Someone's saying hello? Compelled to be outrageous? Ah, I've, had, I've got a lovely question here. Do you think his desire to challenge consumptive stereotypes led to his other socially challenging works? Um, let me think. I don't. I think the consumptive stereotype thing wasn't a, wasn't his main drive. I think. I think he, he felt compelled to be outrageous in every possible way, and it was just one of the ways in which he could be outrageous. So he, when he starts to become famous in the early 1890s, apparently this is a moment when we see a greater frankness about discussions of sex and sexuality in English culture than had been the case for, you know, perhaps a couple of generations. And he's riding on that um, growing market for some kind of adult frankness about the fact that sex exists, for example. When everything kind of shuts down with the arrest of Oscar Wilde in 1895, I was going, no, 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 everything's disgusting. Um, rather than stopping and thinking, oh, no, I better rethink my life choices, Beardsley, Beardsley just decides, no, no, I'm carrying on. I'm carrying on being more and more outrageous. Um, 
are all the books I've shown available in new print runs? Now let's see, yellow book, basically most of the images, you'll find loads and loads of um, books containing the works of Aubrey Beardsley everywhere. I can't speak for these particular 1890s first editions. Yellow books are not, they're not especially rare because they're produced in large numbers. So you might find them in big university libraries, specialist libraries might have a few. I've seen quite a few at John Moore's university. There are also catalogues. I think there's a, a recent catalog of the complete drawings of Aubrey Beardsley, which is over a thousand drawings um, he produced in his very short lifetime. You can also see the, um, the exhibition, which shut down as, almost as soon as it opened. Um, it's supposed to be running in London at the moment. There, and um, I was supposed to go with Emma, who's there. Um, and the documentary that I was in was kind of tied in a little bit, I think, to that, to that um, exhibition. I think they're doing some things online as well. But the best way to see Beardsley's work, personally, I think, is not on a wall in a gallery. They're, they're designed to be seen in books. So if you can get a cheap secondhand copy of any drawings of Aubrey Beardsley, you're seeing them almost exactly as he drew them. He drew them specifically for that format. Do I have any other questions here? Has somebody shared my Twitter and things like that? I'd be happy to answer questions no matter how strange. No? Well, if nobody has any more questions for now, please do um, find me on Twitter or um, email me and I'll try my very best to, if not answer your questions, then suggest even stranger questions. Thank you very much.